All right, all right. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. It's been so long since I last seen you. I missed you. I hope you missed me. We are here for season two of the Lawyer Up with Steve-O podcast on the Boss Up Houston Network. Um, it's my pleasure to continue to bring you some great information. Last season, we had so much fun. I hope you did, too. I hope you learned quite a bit. Um, but this season is going to be a little bit different. We, you know, I hope to give you a lot more information. And as you can see, I have a lot more guests. Usually, I only have one you know, person sitting next to me every now and then, or I'm by myself, but I said, I don't want to be lonely anymore. So I brought six people to be with me today, and we have a great show for you. We have a lot of information to give you. Um, this show is called Pandemic and the Law. So um, a lot has happened since we last saw, seen each other. A lot has happened during while we last saw each other. Um, and the big elephant in the room is the COVID-19 pandemic, and we want to talk about different issues and how it has affected our community. But we also want to give you some tidbits and some information that you can walk away with so that you can help yourselves, help your loved ones, help your friends. Um, we just want to see everyone do well. So, um, you know, it, it takes a community to raise a child and, you know, everyone on here believes that as well. So we want to band together as that community and give you these resources that, that you need. I'm, I'm, I feel like Santa Claus in, in March, but uh, I'm trying to give you that much information to, to, to help you out. So. Um, for those that are new to the show, <clears throat> let me give you a little bit of a background on me. My name is Steve Okora. I'm a practicing attorney in uh, Fort Bend in Harris County. Uh, I've been practicing a little over nine years. I do family law, family law, I do business and contracts, I do estate planning, I do traffic tickets, a um, little bit of everything under the sun. So, um, you know, definitely if you have any legal issues, you can definitely feel free to reach out to me. I don't know or I don't do it uh, or I don't do what it is that you need then I can definitely find find you someone that does and I have some attorneys here too I always hang around attorneys so I'm always going to bring you a fresh perspective so um, and what the show is about um, what I do is I give you legal tidbits and um, little little bits of knowledge so that it can help you in your everyday life help you avoid some some life's pitfalls um, and get you out of sticky situations so that you don't need people like me um, whether or not you like attorneys or not, we're kind of essential, not as essential as medical workers, but I feel like I'm biased, we are essential. Um, but we want to give you some information nonetheless. So, um, as you can see, we have several, um, several guests here, and they all have different expertises um, in, in various areas of society and, and the community. So, um, what we want to do is break them up into you know different topics and, and discuss these things and we're gonna we're gonna also um, allow them to comment on each other's you know perspective and we're gonna have a little bit of a dialogue so that you guys can know some of the ins and outs of what's going on um, some of the things maybe you didn't know that was going on during the pandemic um, but before we get into all that we're gonna take a quick commercial break because we want to make sure and I was told that we're not going on a commercial break because we don't have time for all that right now. So we're going to get right into it. That's good for you guys. So they, they saved you guys from, from a commercial. So um, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start on my right, and I'm going to go down and tell you who these people are. And then we're going to jump right into it and, and get into this, uh, you know, everybody's information that, that we're, we're going to be talking about today. So to my right, uh, we have Farha Ahmed. She is a business and um, business and just a business law attorney, business and probate attorney. There we go. There was something else that I was I was rem remembering. It was on the tip of my tongue. Um, and then we have Pastor Dare, who is the author of the Big Boss series and the Who Am I series. We have Constance Jones, state officer for the Texas Black Caucus and executive VP of Community Affairs. To my left, we have Jamie Jordan, who is a family law attorney here in Fort Bend County. We have Adam Sanchez, who is a planning and zoning commissioner in Stafford and the Texas Public Works first responder. And then we have Ash uh, Haman Rami, uh, Stafford Municipal Board trustee. So we have a lot of great people here on stage. Um, I'm very fortunate to have them uh, because they have very unique perspectives on, on what we're going to talk about. So. Um, the first, first I wanted to talk about was small businesses. Now, we all know that the effects of the pandemic on small businesses, um, some of your favorite businesses didn't last. Maybe they, they closed up shop. 
Uh, maybe they had to downsize. Maybe you know some friends and family that um, may have been laid off from their job. A whole lot has happened to, to small businesses. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, well, fortunately, it has brought also a wave of opportunities uh, for, for some people. I mean, a lot of people have jumped into their, their side hustles and, and know exactly, um, they found that inner passion that they've been able to do and they've now turned it into something that, you know, they, they really um, enjoy. So, um, but we are going to now consult with our business attorney uh, here, uh, Ms. Farah Ahmed. How are you doing today? Doing great. Good, good, good. So, Thank you for having me on the show. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm so, so glad to have you. So um, in keeping with that, um, that small business theme, what have been some of the highs and lows of the pandemic on small businesses? I, I'm, I'm desperately trying to look at highs, at least for my uh, small business clients. I mean, it has been devastating. And obviously it's not something that they were prepared for or predicted. And I think that we have seen businesses struggle. I mean, they're obviously dealing with rent and arrears and things like yep. that and evictions and all that. But if, if there is a certain kind of high, you would look at innovation. You would look at small businesses really trying to make sure that they can use, you know, their online business or, you know, pick up service and, you know, for restaurants. Um, you know, the dining issue has always been uh, an issue in terms of looking for outdoor dining. Yep. And then, of course, you know, you have to make the pickup orders and things like the delivery systems yeah. that are there. And then specifically, like restaurants, and I was looking at, you know, certain communities, the weddings are huge. I think all the communities now, weddings are huge. <laughs> yeah. <you know>. um, <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but a lot of my clients are, are South Asian clients, and we were talking about different cultural communities and that has been really devastating because you'll have a small business footprint for very small dining and yeah. really focused on catering mm -hmm. and their banquet halls and that's all gone and of course the hotels are stuck in that also yeah dealing with weddings and and um and other events and conventions and things like that and the cities have tried to come up with ideas like in the city of sugarland they had a program where um, if you went out and you went dining at a certain place or you bought a certain number of things, if you saved your receipt and you sent it into the city, mm -hmm. the city would send you gift cards for other businesses to try to kind of get you wow. back and spend your money. And the city spent a quarter of a million dollars of their budget for this program. Wow. So they pre-bought all these gift cards for these different businesses to Good. try to help them get jump started. And what, what cities are these? The city of Sugarland was the okay. one program that I did. It was like wow. a sweet program. It was it was really nice. How effective it was, I mean, we'll find out later. Okay. Um, but the, the cities were struggling in, in you know trying to find a way to get people to keep continuing uh, to go out and purchase. And of course, if your wages are tanking, that's going to be very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I will say we can turn the corner. I mean, you're seeing the restrictions lifting, the mm -hmm. capacity lifting. People are getting vaccinated. They've figured out a way to safely do the things they want to do. You are having in this country some of the highest saving rates we've ever seen, up to 30%, unheard of. So what is that telling you is that people are going to be ready to spend this money. They've been kind of boarding it, yeah. right? <laughs> um, you know, everyone's budget has been very minimal right yeah. now, not a lot of travel and things like that. And so you will see this snapback you know, when the restrictions are dropped a bit further and people feel safer to come out. You know, whether the idea is, can you make up that money that you lost, that potential yeah. revenue? That's, yeah. a, that's the part that's devastating. <clears throat> I don't think you can. Yeah. But there may be one exception, which is what if your competition is not there, right? That's true. You survived and your competition didn't survive. Yeah. And that's one of the things to look at. So that's, I mean, we're looking forward for the business And, and people going out. I can't go to the movie theater. I can't go, you know, to my favorite store that's not like a big, you know, big business, big nationwide business. But that, 
in, influx of people just walking in and out. So, um, but yeah, but you know, I'm, I'm hoping now that you know, with with the vaccine, you know, coming and um, you know, people continuing to practice social distancing and masks and everything, we can get back to some semblance of normal. I mean, I don't think we're ever going to get to 100% normal. Maybe. I mean, I'm hopeful, but. Um, as long as we can get everybody educated, you know, about you know the right things to do, so that we we don't have this happen again, I think that's probably going to be going to be best. You know, people are hopeful. I mean, yeah. If you look at travel bookings and now wedding booking venues, they're going up. It's all full. Yep. And you'll see prices go up too. Yep. So yes. Now, yeah. all the bargains that you had during during COVID are gone, yeah. and things are going to be costing a little bit more than even pre-COVID. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, just like everybody else, I'm, I'm hoping to see that, that, that bounce back because, I mean, we, we really need, our communities depend on these small businesses. So um, when they thrive, you know, we all do well. So Absolutely. it's good, 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 good. I really like that idea that Sugarland did because here at Step, we're in Stafford. Here at Stafford, <coughs> we rely on that sales tax on, you know, the, yep. the small businesses. Mm -hmm. And now that they put it in their budget or they took from their budget and put it in them, so they'll basically get some of that back because of the sales tax and so it kind of works out you put a little money in the ecosystem and, and you kind of you know jump it a little bit maybe not where it was but you kind of you know you go here like let's say mr ash goes and then i get the gift card right and then i'll go to that to another business and it just keeps on going kind of like that uh that starbucks line like thing pollinating yeah there you go there. Yeah. <laughs> And I yeah. think it, it gave a signal to the business community. The city was telling them, we have your back. We're watching. We're trying to do different things. We've never had this situation before, and we're trying something to really help you, to encourage that business to kind of stay afloat and just get through this difficult time. Very interesting. Yeah. Definitely. No, I, I was just wondering, um, speaking of um, small businesses, you know when it first happened and the government was allowing all of the PPP loans, et cetera. How do you think the businesses played into that part, especially, specifically, particular certain small businesses, they wasn't qualified or they didn't receive any of the money. So they were basically kind of left just out there, whereas other bigger businesses are, I guess you could say more popular businesses, they were able to receive that. So what do you think that the small businesses and the ones that received it as it relates to those loans that the government was actually, you know, offering um, the different business. But unfortunately, we all know majority of them, they were not eligible and they did not receive that money. So they had no opportunity to regroup like other folks did as far as receiving that money. So what do you think we're at as far as percentage wise with those particular businesses versus the ones that received the money and the ones that was eligible, but they didn't receive it. I think you're right. I think in the beginning, the government was stumbling. And when that, yeah. when that first PPP mm -hmm. process came out, it was really badly handled. And you're right, mm -hmm. small businesses didn't know how to access. People were scrambling, they were asking their CPA, their lawyer, whatever, how do I get this? And, and even nonprofits could have taken advantage of this too. And so I think, it, I think the PPP came out, there was like a second version of it where mm -hmm. more money came out. And I think then you had more people. I don't have percentage data, mm -hmm. data, but I think more people were able to access it. And that saved a lot of the businesses. A lot of my small business owners said that that really saved them to stay on. They had really nice landlords that were working it out and didn't evict them and realized we want to keep you on, pay your employees, and then let's just wait till these restrictions kind of uh, reduce and then just hang in there. And I think that's the signal they were giving. So I think the second PPP was really helpful. But you're right, there were some businesses that just could not get it. They didn't have the banking relationship. Yeah. I think that was one of the, the complaints that mm -hmm. if you don't have a strong banking relationship with that, you were kind of left out in the cold or something. Yeah. It, uh, and I think, in my opinion, going forward, um, just even with any kind of disaster, as far as how it was initially set up, I'm thinking, speak, speaking from a compliance standpoint and the criteria and the structure, I'm thinking the whole entire structure and process needs to be a 
not so much the pandemic, of course, we don't want that to happen, but just the idea for a small business period to be able to go and be a part of and be able to receive that kind of money that the government was doing because it was really saying all of these mom and pop shops that a lot of us that we frequent, you know, and, and basically they did not survive, let's face it. They were the ones that's left out. It was yeah. shut down and they're never open again. So I just look at the top, the core of what the whole entire process is. Yeah. And for me, in my opinion, the process needs to be restructured and regrouped to whereas if any kind of disaster, national, whatever, happens that they can actually be able to move forward in, in a positive manner where everybody can have an opportunity to have a part of that, to help their business to survive. Yep. That's, that's what I think. Yes. 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 Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's all about, you know, education yes. and, and making mm -hmm. sure people know no. exactly what's out there mm -hmm. and what, what yes. to do in these situations. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that's yeah. the biggest thing. That and was lacking too. Definitely. The education part of it. Definitely, you know, yeah. the ins and outs. Yeah. Like you said, everybody kind of stumbles. So, yeah. Yeah. And speak, speaking of education, I want to go to our, our, our next topic, um, which we have uh, Ash uh, Amin Rami covering. Um, he is. to learn from home. And it's very different having classrooms on Zoom than being there in person. Um, a lot of parents have been. So it's been a burden on them, you know, but, uh, you know, people have, have had to overcome a lot of different obstacles with, with the educational system. And I'm sure the schools have had their own obstacles. The government has had their, their own obstacles. Private institutions have had their own obstacles. So, um, so Ash, um, what, what are areas that schools have had to adapt to during, during the pandemic and kind of what's, what's been going on with that? Absolutely. Steve, I just want to start off by saying uh, how excited I am to be part of your show and to be among such an esteemed group of people. Great, yeah. It's, it's very exciting. One of the things that happened, uh, and it, it essentially happened this time last year, was we sent our kids off for school break. Yep. And they didn't come back for over a year. And there's several students. In fact, a good majority, about a third to a half in most districts have still not come back in person. Wow. And when that happened, no one expected it. Our infrastructure wasn't built for it. Teachers weren't trained for it. Administration had no idea what was going on. And the school board trustees were asked, hey, what do we do now? And we were looking at guidance from the state. We were looking to the federal government. And no one had any idea what was going on. Mm -hmm. And so number one, our priority was safety. It's how do we keep our students safe? Because we have no idea what this virus is going to do. And again, this is before we knew you know, the survival rate, before we knew how it spread. There was yep. a lot of unknowns at this point. How do we keep our students safe? So we all went and said, hey, we got to shut the school down and let's go remote. Fortunately, we had spring break to give us some time to plan. But again, a week to plan something that is, you know, we spent generations and generations. The way we have school today has been built over generations. And people forget that. You know, our teachers, the faculties, everything, the facilities, everything that's done is built around teaching students face to face. Yep. And that was upended. So we got our students in. And then when we sent them all home, we realized there's other problems. And I know Attorney Jamie will touch on some of this, but there was issues with abuse and mental illness that was coming out. That's always yep. been in society, but now we're seeing this exaggerated. And part of keeping our students safe from the virus was also how do we keep them safe inside their own homes? And to do that, we had counselors reach out, and counselors and our teachers were phenomenal people. And, and you know, again, I think the reason we got to where we are today and have somewhat survived this has been because of our teachers, our counselors, our staff. And they reached out, they know these students. For them, it's like their second parents. And a lot of our students don't have parents or don't have a family support system that a lot of us take for granted. For them, that family is their teacher. That parent is their teacher or their coach or someone at their school. Yep. And so when that person was reaching out to them on the phone and saying, hey, what do you need? How can we help you? We quickly figured out what our students need. Number one was food. So one of the beautiful things at Stafford a Municipal School District that we've done since I've been on the board is every single student, regardless of income, regardless of anything, gets a free lunch. A free yeah. breakfast, and most recently, a free dinner. Wow. wow. And so we were one of the only schools in the Eastern area that does that. Wow. And 
when that went away, we're like, how do we get food to our students now? Because they've come to rely on this. And so we started delivering food. We had bus drivers that were ready. And our bus drivers, again, they're out there on the front line. They volunteered for this job. We said, hey, you know, this is a little risky. You're going to be delivering to a lot of different households. How do you feel about that? They said, we will do it. Clap. Wow. And then we also allowed pickup. Now, again, not all the students have cars. Not all the students have parents that can take them to school. But the ones that did picked up food. Our drivers. have counselors checking up on them. We've got teachers that are making sure that they're okay. And now we've got food to them. So how do we teach them, right? And the primary purpose of any school district is to teach and is to educate our students. And one of the challenges we had was we went remote with no infrastructure in place on how we're gonna handle going remote. Mm -hmm. So we issued, and we would, we'd already had a plan in place to issue iPads to every single one of our students. And the rollout was the idea is you give every single student an iPad, and again, the district pays for the iPad. And they take it home, oh. so whether they have internet or not at home, they have a device that they can use. That was a five-year rollout that we were planning. We ended up doing it in three months. And so every wow. single one of our students this after has an iPad now. And they can get on Zoom and they can learn. And what we found was it was very effective, but at the same time, it's very challenging. It still isn't the same, especially as you go from senior years all the way down to pre-K. You realize once you get kind of past high school, those students have a really tough time. Can you imagine kindergartner, first grader sitting in front of a screen for six hours, seven hours trying to learn? Yeah. It, it does not work. It's not. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we, we made it work and we've tried to make it work. And then we also started opening the schools up again and figuring out where we get funding for masks, for what are the cool devices that we have. And I'm a big fan of this. We've got iPads that sit in front of every single building. And when you walk up to the iPad, there's a, there's a thing that measures your temperature, makes sure that you're wearing a mask, and it tells you whether you can go in the building or you can't. And so things like that, we've, we've funded and had innovative things that have happened. And what's really interesting, and I've got to mention, mention side hustles, because uh, your season finale is about side hustles, and I enjoyed yeah. that. So yeah. those of you who haven't watched it, go watch the season finale. <laughs> but uh, someone who actually created that device or the app is actually someone who did on a side hustle. And now that's wow. a full-time gig, and they're you know, multi, multi-millionaires, because they built a phenomenal business doing something like that. That is really cool. Yeah. Um, so what what I what I've heard is Sugarland gives vouchers uh, to go and patronize small businesses, and Stafford gives all of their kids breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and iPads. That's that's awesome. I mean, anyone who lives in Stafford and Sugarland, I wish I did now. I I'm, I, I want to move now. I mean, it's 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 so great to hear. But I mean, you're you're right. I mean, I'm I'm glad that a side hustle can turn into something that's so beneficial for for schools. Um, just, just having you know that as a, a measure of safety, you know, for the schools coming for kids coming back to school, um, is 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 really great. And you know, of course, people that are just able to volunteer.